Well, I guess we'll get started with uh, introductions. Uh, my name is Sue Neer. I'm the uh, Development and Marketing Officer at the Montana Historical Society. And welcome to our second Saturday. Um, every second Saturday of the month, we have free admission and try to offer a great program for you. Um, and our sponsor is uh, Helena Community Credit Union. So thanks to those guys. And if you haven't, we do also do a raffle. So sign up for that. Um, and also, we do have a, a special um, uh, promotion going on, I guess you would say, for a $100, <clears throat> a $100 donation to the Montana Historical Society for the Montana Heritage Center Fund. Uh, John Ulberg uh, has uh, graciously agreed to give um, $100 donors a limited edition print of Stan line that he um, had done. It's a, a watercolor, and so these are limited to 250. So um, if you uh, like Stan or like John or both or want to um, give some money for the Heritage Center, it's a good time. So you can see me if you're interested in that. Um, also, uh, today after the program, Amanda Streeter Trum, who is there in the back corner, is uh, our um, curator of the current exhibit on Stanline, the Comic Creations. So uh, she'll be around if you have any questions, and uh, Loretta will also be around so for a little while. Um, so uh, we're really happy to have Loretta here today. Uh, Loretta Line is a fourth generation Montanan. Uh, who was raised on a ranch on the Crow Indian Reservation, where her Irish great-grandparents arrived following the railroads west. She holds a bachelor's and master's degree in journalism from the University of Montana and has taught college-level writing classes. Her 30-year career in the newspaper business took her to Wisconsin, Montana, South Dakota, and Iowa before she returned to Helena. She was publisher of the Helena Independent Record from 1992 to 93 and publisher of the Rapid City South Dakota Journal from 1993 to 1995. In the past 20 years, Loretta has been deeply involved with Irish culture, traveling to Ireland every other year and studying the Irish language both here and abroad. The seeds of this were always there since her father had an abiding interest in both the Irish and Crow cultures. And he passed this on to his children. Loretta served as president of the Montana Gaelic Cultural Society from 2002 to 2012. Following the storytelling tradition of her family, her mother wrote a book on her life following the sheep herds in eastern Montana, and her brother Stan Line created cartoons, art, and books for his entire career. Loretta has written six novels featuring the parallels between the Irish and the Crow culture. Her newest book, Magpie Spirits, was just released this past spring. And this Magpie Odyssey uh, series of books is uh, very well uh, acclaimed, and I have heard a lot of uh, good reviews on them. Uh, Loretta is married to Bob Fusey, retired new newspaper publisher and Helena community volunteer. And today, Loretta is going to look back on the early years of both Stan and her, uh, her family um, growing up on the Crow Reservation. Thank you so much, Loretta. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to see a lot of familiar faces, and there's a few of you I don't know. I want you to be really comfortable. Um, usually, any presentation I do is essentially conversational. So if you have a question in the middle of it, don't hesitate to slow me down. I asked them to set me up so my slides could be stopped at any point, and we're not trying to keep up with the slideshow. So uh, with that, I will begin. When Sue called to ask me to talk about Stan's early days growing up on the Crow Indian Reservation, it gave me pause. Um, I'm always surprised that people have any interest in our family's life there and the influence that life had. Um, there's some part of me that tends to think of our background as pretty ordinary. And then I remember, uh, we had an opportunity unusual in our generation. We were privileged to experience a time of transition 
that had passed many years before in more urbanized parts of, of uh, the United States. And we were lucky to experience it in a little known but splendid part of Montana with a small segment of northern Wyoming uh, thrown in. For that, I have created this map, shows you more or less where this country is located within the state of Montana. The outline around the Crow Reservation is uh, where we spent most of our time, but some of our pasture lands and some of our grazing was outside of those borders. So I thought it was important to uh, show that. This is a sweeping landscape. It straddles the border between the two states, even though the Crow Reservation stops right at the Wyoming border. Some of our pasture went a little deeper into Wyoming. The reason that we find that uh, it's somewhat mysterious is that a lot of people in this part of the state don't understand that some of the highest mountains in the state are actually there. The Bighorn Mountains and the Pryor Mountains are prominent in that country, and a lot of our pasture was there. You'll find some of the most lush valleys, and they're watered by many, many streams um, that originate in the south. They're a little unusual because almost all the rivers run north. I don't know if that's had an effect on our weather and on our pasture land, but it has uh, certainly created some really terrific pasture land. Some of it's prairie. Even today, most of this area is very sparsely populated, particularly uh, up against the Pryor and Bighorn Mountains. The, um, the ranches are far and few between, and there just aren't very many people. Our background's not a lot different from many who grew up in the rural parts of Montana. Maybe we got to live like people in an earlier century during portions of the year uh, when we were with the sheep camps. But in uh, the other seasons, we lived like everybody else, with the possible exception that we may have really enjoyed the running water, the indoor bathrooms, and uh, electricity a lot more. <laughs> to talk about Stan's early years, I'm going to ask your tolerance to give me a minute to go back just a little further than Stan uh, to our grandparents and how the lines came to come to that reservation and be there. Our grandparents, Bill and Emma Line, moved from Gillette, Wyoming, to what was a new railroad stop on the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy line in 1913. This rail station was at a small market town on the Crow Indian Reservation known as Lodgegrass, Montana. It was just a few miles from the Little Bighorn Battlefield. My father, Myron Lind, was six years old, and his sister, Catherine, was an infant when they arrived there. I apologize for the quality of the picture, but it's the only one we have in the family. Shortly after they came to Lodgegrass, Bill Lind opened a livery stable. He built it, and he opened it. He reasoned that anyone who was coming to town to go to one of the bigger cities, like Hardin or Sheridan, would need a place to put their horse when they got on the train. So it was, he'd found his niche market. In addition to the horse boarding facilities and the business that he ran for that, Bill was able to indulge his skills as a horse trader. He bought and sold horses from ranchers and from the Crow tribal people, and he rounded up and broke wild horses for sale. It was a worthy place to be in that country because there were lots of wild horses, and the crow horse culture made it perfect. As our dad got a little older, he spent a lot of time at the livery, helping train horses, doing odd jobs, and listening to the stories the local cowboys told. He passed a lot of these stories on to us kids at unexpected moments, maybe in the pickup truck riding up to attend sheep camp, or just at the dinner table. When my dad was in his 20s, he met and married our mother, who was a city girl. She came from Hardin. <laughs> Stan was their first child, and he was an only for five years. For those of you who know Stan, that's probably the first picture of him. But he was highly uh, touted. He had nice little clothes that my mom made for him. And he was doted upon also by his grandparents. There again is Bill and Emma Lind. By this time, our grandfather had bought a ranch about three miles out of Lodgegrass. 
and our parents and grandparents were all living on it. Between his horse trader grandfather and his stockman father, Stan was introduced to the world of horses early. He sat a horse before he could walk, and frequently from there on. It was around this time that my father, our father, began to work his, uh, his what would become his full career. He began in the sheep business and various ventures around the region. The first place that they, he and my mother lived and worked was a place called the Dryhead Ranch, deep in the Pryor Mountains. It's very remote, uh, and they could only get there by horse or by horse and wagon at the time. And even now, it takes a four-wheel drive to get up there. Come on in. Make yourselves comfortable. Stan was just two years old when they moved there, and you can actually see him right there. He was helping with the chores already. This ranch was, and it remains today, very, very remote, reached only through a rough and stony road. Uh, if any of you have been to the Wild Horse Range, there's a road that continues on after the pavement stops, and you can see it when you're there, and most of us choose not to go that way. That goes on to the Dryhead Ranch. Although they started out in a small sheep operation in partnership with um, our grandfather, that time a small herd was considered to be 1,000 to 2,000 sheep. In their case, they had 2,400. It wasn't long before some of the bigger ranches began to come calling, uh, looking to maybe hire my dad's skills. Dad's first big job was as a sheep herder with the Antler Land Company. And that uh, was headquartered down by Wyola, Montana, almost on the Wyoming border, but they had huge swaths of lease and deeded land all over that end of the state. He uh, was hired to herd sheep during the Depression, and he and my mother were hired as a unit so they could live in the sheep wagon and they could uh, herd sheep from there, and they were just happy to have any job in the Depression. Their food was supplied. They had a roof of sorts over their heads. They felt they had done very well. Later on, they uh, were hired to work for the Mill Iron Ranch, and that is more toward the Hardin area at the foot of the Pryor Mountains instead of the Bighorn Mountains. Um, the outfit was owned by Harvey Wilkett, and uh, at that point, they uh, were even more isolated. That's really a difficult ranch to get to and was really inaccessible until after the uh, Yellowtail Dam was built. You really had to make your way through miles and miles of dirt road. They always had Stan with them at all those times. Uh, the mill iron ran sheep, but they also ran a sizable number of cattle. The era of the big sheep outfits was really coming into its own at that point. There was a huge call for wool, primarily uh, because of the military, their uniforms, their blankets, everything in the military was made of wool, so wool was a very coming uh, adventure. It was a, a, the kind of thing that was really, really going to make... Uh, a lot of the ranchers turned their heads and decided to go there from the cattle industry. There was still that little feeling that eh, it's not really the cattle business. But as one old rancher told my dad, I, hire, I raise cattle for fun. I raise sheep for profit. <laughs> Part of the reason for that was that the sheep had two crops. The wool would basically pay their grazing and their care and pay for their herders and everything. And the lambs were just about pure profit. And people were still eating a lot of lamb in the big cities, so there was call for the meat as well. Our parents and Stan lived in a sheep wagon when they were with the mill iron. And I just want you to kind of burn that image into your mind because we use sheep wagons a lot for the rest of our, our time in the business. All three of them lived in there. This was done a number of times over the years with each one of us kids. There are three of us, and I'll talk about my sister in just a few moments. Uh, we all experienced sharing that small space with our parents at one point or another in our lives. And the way it worked was the small bed that's made for one herder, our parents must have been really cozy. They slept together. And there was a little space underneath where you pulled the table out that uh, a lot of the herders kept their dog there when it was really cold out. But it was room enough for a kid to sleep. You could put a little bedroll under there, and you could put a kid to sleep under there. So uh, we made it work, and you adapt. 
When the weather was good, Stan was allowed to play outside, but only when closely supervised because of the fact that that huge country was rattlesnake infested. Probably still is, because I don't think there's anything that would make those snakes go away. When he did play outside, he was alone, so our mother encouraged him to use his imagination. She did this with all of us. Uh, I can still hear her voice ringing in the back of my mind, use your imagination. We were never allowed to say, I'm bored. It was not acceptable. In bad weather, when mom was working with the cooks, Stan had to spend his time inside because there wasn't anybody to watch him. So she would read to him in her spare moments, which were few, but she also saw that he had paper and pencils, and she taught him the rudiments of beginning to draw. It opened up a whole new world for him. He could depict the life around him, and everyone loved his drawings, even when he was tiny. He had lots of people to fuss over those drawings. As he grew, he couldn't have realized it, but it was about to change his life forever. He got a companion. This is our sister, Chris, Christine. We call her Chris today, but she was Christine throughout high school. When he was five, Chris came along, and he was delighted for her companionship, as you can see, even when she was really tiny. Now he had a sidekick. They got a little bigger. And you can just see how much he just loved her. With sheep locations being so far away, playmates were few and far between. And it didn't matter that they were five years, four and a half years, five years apart from one another in age. She thought he was wonderful. Every idea, everything he wanted to imagine, she was all for. And they developed a really high skill of mutual imagination, which to the time that he, we lost him, she and he were still there. They were still together. This is one of the funniest pictures in the family because he loved all things cowboy. So he liked to play Lone Ranger. And if you only have your golden-haired sister to be Tonto, <laughs> you just go ahead and do that. <laughs> She's, I don't even know she might still have that mask. I'm not sure. But I always thought it was great. It was just that if you're going to use your imagination, hey, imagine she's got black hair. You know, what can you do? Our parents had to move from camp to camp. And there were dozens of cowboys and sheep herders at these camps. And they doted on these two kids. And you can see why. I'm sure it was fun for them to come in from dirty, hard work and see these kids. They uh, were, in many cases, single fellows who had little or no family. And the sight of the children was just delightful to them. One who made a particularly strong impression on Stan was a man whose name was Bill Mills. We have two pictures of Bill. This one is pretty much what he was always like. He did have a visit from an old cowboy friend once, and they saw to it that maybe they'd have a little celebration. <laughs> Bill had come to Montana with some of the early cattle drives, and he decided to stay here. We never knew much about his background, only that he liked being here. He adjusted well from being a, cattle, uh, a cowboy to working with sheep, and he was intensely loyal to our family. He loved our family. He carried an ivory-handled pistol, and he had a shadowy past that he may have talked to our father about, but he didn't talk to anybody else about it. Stan always followed him around, really enjoyed him, and he loved Stan. Stan had a great story about him. He liked to talk about Bill. He, he told that Bill habitually carried this pistol with him all the time. And Stan was fascinated, of course. Little boy, you can't imagine how interesting that must have been. So once, when Stan was about six years old, he got the thrill of a lifetime. Bill put the pistol into his hand, aimed it at a fence post, and, say, and said to Stan, Hold it steady, son, and squeeze the trigger. The roar of the shot startled Stan, made his ears, ears ring, and the recoil made him stumble backward. To the, to the day he died, he said he never had a happier moment in his life. <laughs> in fact, the persona, part of the persona of hip shot percussion is based on Bill Mills. Bill did have a pet cat. And he obviously had kind of a dark and mysterious past. 
And so he, he definitely inspired Stan for many years to come. Stan talked about how these cowboys always gave him and Chris a lot of attention. He found their visits to the house extremely exciting. And he said their stories, their humor, their honorable ways provided a great model for him. He had the best opportunities for observation, and these men captured his imagination forever. And add to that their boots, their hats, their chaps, and their spurs. <laughs> and that matter of living took hold of him in a way that lasted a lifetime. You can see how excited he is here to have the whole outfit. He's even got the pistol. I trust that wasn't a real one, but you never know. One of the tough things for Stan, with the sheep work demanding that the parents be so far out in the country and travel so much, was that there was no way for him to get to school from the camps. So he would have to stay in town with an aunt and uncle during the school year, during the days of school. The parting was sad for him and wrenching for our parents, but it was the only solution at the time. And I think we all know that there's stories about lots of those ranches. In fact, I think there are houses here in Helena that were built specifically for the families to come to town for the kids to be able to get access school. So my mother put her sadness to work at her sewing machine, and she created quite the wardrobe for Stan for his first day of school and probably the early days of school thereafter. As he told the story, I marched off to my first day of school Hair cut and combed, shirt clean and starched, trousers long and pressed, held up by new and natty suspenders. I loved the classwork. I idolized Miss Ross, my teacher, and I reveled in the books, tablets, pencils, glue, and ink that were my new tools of trade. Recess provided my first encounter with kids my own age. And I found that while I liked most of my classmates, there were some who seemed perversely committed to making my life miserable as possible. <laughs> my stylish suspenders, for example, quickly proved to be the focus of both derision and interest on the part of my peers. Snapping them smartly with a quick sneak attack became one of their preferred recess games. Because the attacks always came from behind, I was unable to retaliate until my tormentors were completely out of my reach. Stan said this experience led him to conclude that his father didn't wear suspenders but only a belt for no other reason than no one could snap his suspenders. And the whole experience pretty much put him off of suspenders for the rest of his life. <laughs> Experiences like this made him eager to return to the family on vacation days and in the summers, where he could be at home in the big landscape and the high country. His growing reading skills continued to give him access to worlds beyond his own. But he also had his own little chores. He carried wood, he helped uh, bring coal in for the stoves, things like that. But he already loved the comics and the newspapers when the family could get the newspapers, and he liked comic books. Because he was an early reader and cherished books, they occupied whatever time he could find between those chores and his time with his sister. Like all ranch kids, he had those tasks from the earliest years, but he always found time to read when he was finished. Beyond the cowboys and the sheep herders, the Crow Indian people had a huge influence on our lives. Many of them had bought, sold, and traded horses with my grandfather, and, my, uh, and many had grown up with my father. Both our grandfather and father were adopted members of the tribe, as Stan was later on. Often, members of the tribe were our landlords because we leased a lot of land for grazing, for crops, and for grain. We counted many of them as family friends. There was seldom a day when a native person did not come to our home for either a visit on a personal basis or for business. And my parents loved to visit their camps and the Crow Fair and all the things that you still hear about today. As I noted before, the lands of Crow Country were enormous, and many parts of them are isolated and almost unreachable. Our parents moved from camp to camp, staying in places with such evocative names as Point Creek Falls, Woody Creek, Beauvais Creek, Lemon Springs, Gold Hill, Eagle Springs, Reno Hill, 
the Cash and Ranch, the Dry Head, Windy Point, Black Canyon, Big and Little Bull Elk Canyons. As Stan grew up, he spent a lot of time by our father's side and probably picked up an ear for names of interesting places for his strips and his books from being in those particular locales. As always, he was observing and imagining and dreaming. Because the country was huge, we didn't have the luxury of some ranches have today. This is a single band of sheep, and you can see there's quite a few of those, and it's lambing. The sheep wagon is there so that the herder can catch a few winks in between walking through that big herd of sheep looking for newborn lambs, which would have been put in these little pens protected only by tarps for each you and her babies. And it was a long, hard job. So uh, we had to do this for a long period of time because of how many sheep we were working with at that point. And it was vast, vast country. Here's some of the grazing land, and you can just see it goes on forever. At the height of our sheep ranching, when my dad was one of the sheep partners with the Antler Land Company, each of these partners had more than 12,000 head of sheep. These animals were managed in an open range with techniques that are pretty much forgotten today. And the grazing was vast as well. Again, the land, as you can tell, could support that, but it required somebody who had a real sense of direction, because <laughs> I'd have been lost for weeks out there if somebody turned me loose. I think these slides give you a sense of the scale. The other challenge, another aspect of that region, was something that we'll just call gumbo. It was one of the greatest challenges of that area. The soils are aptly named gumbo, and they're a fine, silty clay dirt. Some of you, I'm sure, have experienced them, but my dad always described them as being kind of the consistency of um, biscuit dough. And you know what it's like to try to get that off your fingers. Well, just apply that to your pickup truck. He often said riding a horse, our, our dad often said riding a horse all day long through gumbo would result in you having a taller mount by the end of the day. <laughs> this made for interesting roads with even the slightest amount of rain. You wanted rain, but you wanted to be where you were going before it came because the, all the roads were dirt. This is just a small example, but I thought a very, very good example of what that ground looks like. The other thing was... Because it was primitive and quiet out there and not very populated, there weren't a lot of bridges, so you could get in some interesting situations just trying to go visit on a Sunday. This is one of the other sheep partners' wives right here, and I'm sure she was just coming out to visit. They probably had to walk into the ranch, ask somebody from the ranch to help pull them out of the little creek crossing there. There wasn't a bridge. A lot of times we used horse teams because of this. If it had rained, you were better off not even trying to take your four-wheel drive out because uh, that's another little piece of knowledge from that country. You can get a four-wheel drive stuck worse than any other vehicle there is because you can get all four wheels stuck really good. But the grazing was ideal. That kind of soil supports fantastic growth of hardy grasses that have lots of nutrients, and it was great for sheep. We were in the prairie, in the lowlands, in the summer, in the winters, and in the summers we went to the Bighorn Mountains, which posed another problem because those two track roads are pretty much all rock. But the grazing again is beautiful in the spring and summer because it's cool, the sheep's wool grows well up there, and there's lots and lots and lots of feed. But you can get caught by surprise once you're up there. At that elevation, you can get unexpected snows. And again, horse and wagon was sometimes the only way to transport. Stan often helped load and tow the wagons at our peak. We had at least 10 to 12 herders and as many wagons, and they were scattered all over the Bighorn Mountains. And if we were down in the uh, lowlands, then they were scattered all over the prairies. So trips over miles and miles of hard scrabble roads, either to, either to move or 10 camps, 
were pretty much a weekly, if not more often, occurrence. In a postscript to this, because I'm sure you're all looking at me and wondering a little bit, some, you might wonder where I fit in, because <laughs> there's this odd little extra person here. Well, when Stan was 15 and Chris was 11, I showed up. The remarkable thing was that the sheep ranching hadn't gotten very modernized at that point. It still remained pretty much like they did it at the turn of the century, primarily because we had um, some distant country that we had to be across. You just might want to get another aspect there of Stan and me. The main reason that we continued to function like the turn of the century was that our second ranch location, the one that we occupied in Four, four to five months in the summer, was a place known as the Cashin Ranch. And it was uh, 40 miles from much of anything on dirt roads, just like the ones I showed. And um, it had no electricity. It had only the heat of a wood stove. And it had uh, water that you could pump out of a hand pump, but you couldn't drink it. So we hauled water in barrels for drinking water. And then we um, pumped the other and heated it on the stove if you wanted a bath or if you wanted to do your laundry uh, or if you wanted to wash dishes or scrub the floor or anything like that. It wasn't good drinking water, but it could be used for everything else. And, of course, there was the ever-present outhouse. Reached over a path that might or might not harbor a rattlesnake. And some summers... We had to stay in the sheep wagon because we would give the house to the cook and her family to, to live in. So if it was, came down to whether the cook had access to the kitchen quickly and easily, we put her in the house. Um, I still marvel at those four months because it was almost an alternate universe. My friends were home playing with their bicycles. You couldn't really ride a bicycle in this country, as you can see. Uh, they were playing Gabe's with each other next door. There wasn't a playmate anywhere to be had. So from probably until I was about five and a half, six, I always had Chris, my older sister, to kind of help entertain me. And maybe I'd be lucky enough that the cook would have kids that were somewhat near my age, but not always. So Stan went off to college when I was three. Chris went off to college to study nursing when I finished the first grade, and we were still going out to this ranch, but they could come home in the summers and be some help for those first few years. Then Stan joined the Navy, and as you know, that was when his uh, cartoon career began to grow, even though he hadn't invented ricochet yet. And Amanda's exhibit out here in the lobby is just a splendid uh, depiction of everything from Stan's career forward. A little bit of his high school stuff, too. But as you can see, there were a lot of years before that uh, I'm touching on. So in summary, what did growing up on the Crow Reservation contribute to our lives? I guess Stan was destined to be a storyteller. He could probably not have helped it no matter what. In our family, you can mark it up to tradition and to a Western heritage, but for us, it's a lot more. We came from an Irish-American heritage, and that's very much an oral storytelling side. Uh, it's a culture of telling stories. It's a culture of oral histories. We were raised on the Crow Indian Reservation where oral storytelling is long and deep and for many years was the only storytelling because there wasn't a written alphabet. Our ranch was populated by cowboys and sheep herders who whiled away their spare moments telling stories instead of television or instead of video games or the things that kids might have now, we got to hear cowboy stories. Our father was a skilled oral storyteller, and our mother was a writer of stories. So it was inevitable, I think. We all know Stan was a well-known storyteller in pictures and words. His early career with cartooning, and later his eight novels, all bear testament to that. All the influences I've mentioned in this talk today have uh, given his work a depth and breadth that came directly from those years, in my opinion. It became a passion with him in childhood and stayed with him for life. His stories and drawings left Montana and us better than we were. 
and his early years on the Crow Indian Reservation had a lot to do with that. So I am open to entertain any questions any of you might have or any comments. I'm, I'd be happy to answer. Yes. Stan was born in 31, and uh, our grandparents, of course, came to the reservation in 1913, so some of the really early pictures were before that. But the time frame where we were really way out in that far country was probably the 30s forward until my parents sold their share out of uh, their ranching operation in 1969. So that's what makes it a little odd is that, you know, you might expect that maybe Stan and even Chris would grow up in that more primitive setting, but we continued to live like that through the 60s. Did you have to stay in town to go to school? Was that school? Uh, Terry's asking whether I had to stay in town uh, to go to school, and I did go to school in the town of Lodgegrass. All of us did. My father did. We did. Uh, but by that time... Um, we had kind of created a rhythm where my mom could come to town, or if she couldn't, we could hire somebody to be with me when I was small. And we had built a house in the town of Lodgegrass by that time. That was post-war, probably. The house probably went up in about 1950. So from then on, before I got into school, which would have been 1954, uh, that was when we had a townhouse, a townhouse. And that's what it was called. That's what we called it all the time. <laughs> Other questions? Well, I really thank you for your attention today. It's been a pleasure to talk about this. And, and Paulette, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you, Paulette. Um, so your dad must have been a storyteller, too. So was a lot of your time spent with your dad telling stories and telling stories? Yes. Uh, she's asking if our dad was a storyteller. He was probably the best of all of them because he had all the accumulated stories that he heard as a kid and all of the stories he picked up from the sheep herders that he was out uh, tending their camps. And a lot of the sheep herders came from other countries, so you really got a breadth of, of uh, storytelling. I know that in Paulette's family, they came from the Basque region, but a lot of ours were Irish and Scottish, including one fellow who played the bagpipes and scared the bejesus out of his horse. Uh, <laughs> But, but because of that, they had stories that were sometimes Western stories, but sometimes maybe more of the uh, folklore versions from their own homeland. So that was really another enriching factor, I think. Mitzi? How hard was it for Stan to break into the cartoon business, especially with Stan Bush? That's an interesting story, and it comes a little later than my talk, but... Uh, Mitzi's asking how hard it was to break into cartooning, and it was really hard, but it was uh, kind of an interesting um, meant-to-happen event when it happened because he had submitted his cartoon idea to multiple syndicates, none of whom would, would uh, bite. They all rejected him. And finally he just said one day, what the heck, I'm going to go into the biggest syndicate in, in town. He was working in New York City as a reporter at the time, and he walked in, and they had just had to make a change in their cartooning. They'd lost a fellow who was doing a cartoon, I believe it's called Red Rider. And that cartoonist needed to move over and do another strip because uh, the cartoonist who did it had gotten sick or had died, and they needed a Western strip. So rather than breaking in slowly with a small syndicate, he walked into the New York Daily News Chicago Tribune Syndicate as, as his first syndication. And that really was a, a remarkable break. He said that he, the next morning, just a side story, the next morning he walked the streets waiting for the first paper to come out with, with or not the next morning, but the first paper to come out with Ricochet in it. He said it was still dark when they brought the papers to the newsstands in Times Square, and he got a paper and opened it up, and there was Ricochet. Other questions? Susan. <laughs> that, 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 the pictures that you showed today, I have read in your book. Yes. Is, is that a, am I assuming 
Susan is asking if uh, I get a few of the placements for my stories from the, all of that area that we grew up in. And absolutely. I think you can't write what you don't know. And for me, uh, there's no more splendid landscape to describe, no more splendid feel of the places. And because I write mysteries and, and novels, there's a lot of mystery and, and novelty to that country. It's just so unusual and so... Uh, it just captivates you. And is, was Dry Head part of that? Did that, as you were talking about that, that thing to me that I might have read about that someplace? <laughs> you didn't read about Dry Head exactly, but the Dry Head Ranch House, in answer to your question about whether the Dry Head's part of, uh, part of my writing, the Dry Head House is the model for the Laura House. That is the house. So yes, you, you've, you caught me. Other questions? Terry. I'm asking about your mother's writing, because she was a writer also. Yes. Uh, Terry's asking about our mother's writing. And our mother uh, wrote a lot of stories, and she always kept a journal, which might only be a sentence a day sometimes, but every single day, from way before she met our dad, she wrote a little something about every day of her life. But when our father was in his last years and he was pretty um, ill, she used that time to interview him, and then she produced one book of their life. It's called Daylight in the Canyon. It's uh, the story of them following the sheep herds. The cover was done by Stan. The introduction uh, was done by me. And uh, it's, it's a nice book if you want to feel for that daily life of doing that. So that, that was her way. And then she read a lot. She read to us. She read for herself. She, read, she was very literary. Other questions? John. Um, there's a picture in there of Stan doing some of his chores, carrying wood and things like that. What, what kind of chores did you and Christine do? <laughs> John asked what kind of chores the girls had. <laughs> Our father was pretty ecumenical. <laughs> we carried wood. We shoveled horse poo. Uh, we, uh, in the last years of my dad's life on the ranch while I was still home in high school, it was my job to try to just stay ahead of him because he moved fast and he was, he was very energetic even in his, uh, in his illness. So it was my job to be sure to, change, to get out and open the gates and close the gates behind him and things like that to try to save his strength for the things only he could do. But, yeah, we did all the same chores that Stan did as, as our turn came. And be, with five years' difference between him and Chris, her turn surely came. And then sometimes they like to throw in some of the things for cooking for the men, too. Peeling potatoes is, sticks in my mind. Or it was one of those. So... Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. It's been a great, it's a great day.